Hello, everyone. Welcome. I am Mark Medeiros, Community Engagement Manager at Peninsula Open Space Trust, also known as POST. We're very excited to host you all today to learn more about the history of Indigenous people in the Bay Area. There's more on acknowledgement coming soon, but we wanted to say welcome to members of Native communities who are joining us today. A little housekeeping item that I didn't want to forget. Um, we are reserving some time at the end for questions from the community. Um, you could post these questions in Facebook or on YouTube, um, but if you're not on one of those platforms, we wanted to ensure that you are able to um, pose questions also. Um, so that URL you are seeing there, um, also posted in the Facebook event um, and on our event page, uh, pollev.com slash drycreek013. That is a place where you could submit your questions um, if you're unable to comment through Facebook or YouTube. So first, I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, some of the organizations involved here. This event is made possible through a collaboration with the California State Parks, Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space District, and Peninsula Open Space Trust. And I wanted to share a little bit about each. Most of you will be familiar with our beloved California State Parks, which works to provide for the health, inspiration, and education of the people of California by helping to preserve the state's extraordinary biological diversity, protecting its most value, valued natural and cultural resources, and creating opportunities for outdoor recreation. If you have not heard about Peninsula Open Space Trust before today, POST is a 501c3 nonprofit that has worked since 1977 to protect almost 80,000 acres of land on the peninsula and in the South Bay for the benefit of all residents in our region. We focus on expanding public access as well as protecting wildlife, redwoods, and local farmlands. We do this through the generous support of thousands of community members who donate each year. Thank you to all of you for your support. We'd also like to acknowledge our close partners, Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space District, a special district funded by taxpayers that operates 26 beautiful natural preserves in San Mateo and Santa Clara counties. Um, personally, I wanna say thank you to all park agency staff um, from State Parks, Mid-Pen, uh, Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority, county parks, um, national parks that are working so hard to ensure um, that we have public access during these uh, difficult times. This uh, webinar is an opportunity to deepen our knowledge and appreciation of the true histories of the Bay Area. The purpose of this webinar is to increase our knowledge so that we can support the success of Native communities here. And to help us do that today, we have an incredible man named Mark Hilkema, who will be presenting. Mark Hilkema is the Cultural Resources Program Supervisor for the Santa Cruz District of California State Parks. And here you see him pictured alongside the tribal chair of the Amamutsun tribal band, Valentin Lopez. And we chose this picture because it's a great uh, example of how Mark has worked throughout his career uh, to use his knowledge and his role in support of tribal communities. Mark Hilkema holds a Master's of Anthropology from San Jose State University. He worked as an archaeologist with the California Department of Transportation for 12 years prior to his current role as an archaeologist and tribal liaison for the Santa Cruz District of California State Parks. Mark has led a variety of studies throughout the peninsula and the South Bay, including many areas protected by Peninsula Open Space Trust and our partners. Again, Mark has worked in support of and alongside a variety of Native American communities throughout his decades of work. And with that, I would like to welcome Mark Hilkema. How's Hello. it going, Mark? Pretty good. Um, it's interesting to be broadcasting from the living room of my house and have 
so many people as guests. Thank you. Well, thank you again for doing this. I know this is a, a new um, format for you. You've been teaching for a very long time. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge um, and thank you for taking the time out of your busy week. I know it's a very hectic time um, for state parks and all, all other parks agencies. So um, we really appreciate you taking the time to, um, to be with us here today. A pleasure. Um, so Mark, <clears throat> before we start here, we wanted to address a very important question that I know is on the minds of many of our listeners. Um, again, thank you for telling these stories. I'm deeply grateful to your um, decades of work supporting Native communities. Um, but for those of you who uh, are not familiar with you, I wanted to address this question that's come up um, in advance of this event. Um, and for those of you who are not already thinking about this question, uh, this is an important opportunity to learn as well. Um, so at fir first glance, when I look at you, you present to me as a white man. Um, and many who are listening will ask whether you're native to this area. Um, so can you share some opening comments with our viewers, including a little bit about your history and what made it motivates you in this work? Yeah, I think that's very appropriate considering, um, first thing I need to point out, of course, that the native people we're talking about are still here. Um, they haven't disappeared. We just became many, so it's more difficult for us to see them you know, amongst us. I have had the fortunate experience of spending a lot of time when I was much younger with elders of the various communities, many of whom, most of whom are now gone. And over time, they were very kind to teach me about their culture because there was a fear of it not lasting or not passing down. Um, and so I was learning a great deal fortuitously and just by exposure and just by being open to what people could tell me. And I feel a commitment now to pass on the voices that were spoken to me and the information I was gifted with. And I want to be able to share that with everybody to provide um, people a context for native culture of the area and to celebrate the existence and persistence of culture here. So I'm a little out of step because Native Americans want to control the narrative. They don't really want non-Native people speaking about their culture. And um, I understand that really very well. Um, I can only add that I was just lucky enough to have been nurtured by Native people. And so I feel that the commitment to share the information um, is, is, is the obligation. That's what needs to happen. It's a sharing. So um, the acknowledgement here is that we are on the native lands of a collective of many tribes. We have come to call the Ohlone people. And I'll speak more about that and even show some of the tribal community maps so people can understand how complex the region uh, was and still is. So um, acknowledging that the Ohlone people are still here is the first step. Second step is to rehearse the history so that we can have a context to have discussion about um, things like injustice, social injustice, and uh, you know roles of non-Native people versus Native people. Um, I think this is an appropriate time to actually address those matters. So I hope to do that over the next three weeks actually through the three sessions. It's not a uh, question that I can answer in one swoop. All I can say is my life experiences have brought me here. And as I get older and see that there's only so much time in one's life, it's important to share this so that everyone can uh, benefit from the teachings that I was given. So it's, it's a sharing. I am a native of San Jose in terms of having been born here. My parents emigrated, emigrated here from the Netherlands in the 1930s. So we've been here long enough to see uh, the transitions, you know, from agricultural communities to the urban uh, society we are now. So um, I have a long history of contact with Native people and that I will weave in the thread, you know, throughout our discussion. Thank you for sharing that information, Mark. We wanted to open the conversation with acknowledging that dynamic 
Um, of course, this conversation we're having today is not a substitute for listening to native voices and for learning about contemporary indigenous organizations um, and local tribes and supporting their work. Um, we shared a list of resources in advance of this webinar, uh, linking to many of the local tribes and organizations. It's not a comprehensive list, uh, but it's a starting place. And we encourage any listeners, um, members of these communities to share additional resources and chat. Uh, we have been privileged to host a couple of advanced conversations before this webinar. Um, one with tribal chair of the Amamutsun, Valentin Lopez, and one with Coyote uh, uh, Canyon, um, I'm sorry, Coyote, uh, Canyon Coyote Woman Sayers Roods of Indian Canyon. And we hope to host more such conversations in the future. Um, so with that, I want to say, you know, as, a, as an individual who lives here, the more I've learned about the history of Native people in California, including the incredible diversity, the compl complexity of native stewardship of these lands, the more I've been motivated myself to take care of this place and to support these communities. Um, and I hope everybody else uh, feels really. Um, we're in an a port important moment of history as our society struggles with conversations about racial inequality. Um, and we're realizing that we need a broader understanding of history to know how we as individuals, as a community, as organizations can move forward um, on the path towards justice. So that's the goal of today. And again, I just wanna say thank you so much. Um, I'm honored to be here with you, Mark, and I look forward to what you have to share. Thanks, Mark. I'm eager to, to share with everyone. Great. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay. So as we've been discussing, it's um, awkward for a non-native person to uh, pretend to speak about native cultures here. I just do so because I have learned um, quite a bit and hope to share that with everyone very quickly. Actually, over the next hour, we're gonna spin through quite a number of images to help me keep on track with my conversation. This isn't the usual platform I how when I speak to people. Um, I think for a lot of us, as we come here to the Bay Area and enjoy the open spaces and the natural resources they, uh, they represent, we're oftentimes unaware of the deep time that California has here and you know, how important it is to try and recollect um, you know, the changes that have occurred over time. So uh, with that, I want to move through the next slide and um, highlight the fact that in our world, we're so busy, we don't see the reflections of old California and of the world that as it has been. And um, this discussion that I'm having with you is to focus on the histories and the knowledge of the elders. I'm not going to be speaking about contemporary Native American issues that that's for the people to talk about. That's their story. And I won't presume to overlay my interests on that. I just want to let everyone be aware that it's um, visible if you can see it. Nature is here for us when you can see it. Um, next slide, Mark. Peoples around the world have stories of creation, of where we come from, who we are, where we've been. And the native people of the region were no different. They all had stories of beginnings and uh, worlds that involved um, spirits and uh, creationists, creationism. I think when you look at many Western religions, for instance, there's a reptile with an apple that speaks of knowledge and um, consequence with knowledge. Native people also look for uh, metaphor and allegory in the native uh, natural world around them. Coyote, the wise trickster, is a point of learning. Hummingbird, in, in, you know, symbol of trust and innocence. Eagle with his far sight and uh, ability to travel to spaces beyond. These are all images that native people have 
of uh, ways to explain the world around them. And there's an affinity between native people and the animal people. Um, when they talk about coyote, they're oftentimes not talking about the four-legged creature. They're talking about the spirit, the essence of coyote, the behavior, uh, the attitude. Uh, hummingbird, for instance, with trust and innocence. Uh, we have the mountain here named Amanam or Humunya, which is the root word for hummingbird. It figures prominently in the creation stories of the region. Um, so people talk about beginnings. Native people tell us outsiders that they have always been here. Archaeologists talk about migrations and uh, movements of people around the world. And we use DNA and radiocarbon dating to help reify our points. Native people patiently tell us, well, that's all fine and well, but we've all always been here. We didn't come from anywhere else. And so we see these opinions of creation and it's very enlightening for me to hear that as one of my friends once said, we drink the water that flows through the streams that have the minerals of the rocks. The rocks are timeless. We drink that water, we become the rocks, we become the water. We are timeless therefore too. And so you begin to understand through that teaching that indeed people have been here since the beginning because they are the land essentially. Um, next slide, Mark. <clears throat> when first Europeans come here, they were um, astounded by the great diversity of cultures, languages, and different communities. And as I will speak to later over time, uh, researchers called anthropologists came through and tried to organize the mosaics of native people by language, affinity, and family. And so maps have been created that lay out different names on the landscape that define uh, different communities and groups. And many of us have come to uh, the mistaken conclusion that these maps represent polities or nations. When in reality, the names you see, for instance, on the map on your screen are language families, uh, much like the word Latin, you know, Latin speakers encompass many political boundaries. And, and so it was here in California. California had one of the greatest um, diversities of languages on the planet that represent multiple communities coming in at different times, uh, either mixing with earlier people or displacing them. Um, there's quite a bit of culture history in California. California also had uh, one of the greatest population densities of Native Americans north of the Aztec Empire. And over the next couple of webinars, when we look at the life ways of the people here and their ability to manage the land and increase productivity from nature, we come to a better understanding of how it is that this place could support such a large population of people. In the San Francisco and Monterey Bay area, anthropologists early on lumped that language family into a term called Costanoan. It's derived from the Spanish word costanos, coastal people. And it derives from the fact that when Europeans came in, they weren't um, concerned about the diversity of cultures. And so there were efforts uh, made to lump them into single groups. And the word Ohlone actually comes from uh, many sources. One of the earliest references is in 1924 when California Indians and American Indians in general were finally allowed to be citizens of the United States. Once granted citizenship, they were able to be included in census records. And one of the earliest, earliest census takers um, arriving at Mission San Jose in the mid 1920s found that there were still native people associated with the mission. And as we will see, that is true of many of the mission communities around uh, the state and so the census taker asked the people there, who are you? And they said, we are the Ohlone people of the West. And so that is one source of information for the term. In the 1960s, with the advent of the civil rights movement, one of the Ohlone families associated with Mission San Jose published an article in the first issue of the California Indian uh, Quarterly. It was a new journal of the day. And he wrote about how the people should rather be called Ohlone than Costanoan, which was a term applied by anthropologists. So over the years, um, anthropologists such as myself and archaeologists have come to adopt the preferential term Ohlone to describe 50 individual tribes scattered around the Monterey and San Francisco Bay Area who spoke some seven different languages. Um, it's a very complex culture region. And later in this discussion, I will show you 
some maps that lay out the tribal organizations, the actual polities uh, of the area. Um, so moving along, um, let me add this now. <clears throat> I'm trying to master the slide transitions here. So we get a lot of our first information about the native lifeways here through the lens of conquerors and explorers and missionaries. And it's always important to realize the world that those folks were living in to understand the worldviews they're purporting when they write. So you can't separate yourself from the time when you read the writings of the day. Um, you, you have to realize that they could only perceive the world according to the values they have then. And as the first mariners begin to come up and down the coast of California, starting in the 1540s and eventually finding a sea route to Asia and back, um, explorations of the coast became more and more important uh, because these transoceanic voyagers needed to have safe ports to resupply themselves with fresh water, food, and so forth, and then navigate their way southward to uh, San Blas and Acapulco, where the ships would be unloaded in Mexico. California in those days was an unknown region. And so um, several expeditions came forth by sea to map the coastline, in 1602, Sebastian Vizcaino comes up looking for uh, the Northwest Passage, which of course doesn't exist. And um, he's the first to anchor offshore in a bay. He renames the Bay of uh, the Pines to Monterey to celebrate the Viceroy of Mexico, a very PC thing to do for a military commander. And um, he talks about the native people coming down and feeding them and how kind they were and they go on with this voyage later, but leave a legacy of Monterey being a fantastic harbor, uh, big enough to hold the Imperial fleet of Spain. Well, that information was received with great joy by the empire of Spain. However, they were in competition with other European powder, powers. And so we see the Russians begin coming down the coast um, as they're uh, harvesting fur seals and otters from Alaska and the Spaniards decide it's time that they eventually colonize the Upper California coast and establish their claim to what they call Alta California, Upper California. Um, but it won't be for 147 years after Vizcaino mentions the harbor of Monterey that the first land expedition would even set forth to try and find the place. So you realize that our history is very recent um, in terms of uh, contact and uh, the outside world. So one thing the Spaniards couldn't know because their own world didn't have a sense of deep time was that Native Americans have been here for a very, very long time. They've been here since the Ice Age. And for many people, the Ice Age conjures up you know, certain images. Um, but uh, let's understand that there was an Ice Age that encompassed the world and it did have serious ramifications about where people could settle and moved to. Um, at the time when Native people were uh, moving around, so were other peoples around the world, and the ocean was 300 feet below where it is now. That means there, was, uh, where there were large land masses that were connected. For instance, Southeast Asia, you can see Borneo, Indonesia connected to Thailand, China, Korea, and Japan are one land. England and France are connected, and so is Siberia and Alaska, not for a little while, but for thousands of years. And it's over those landscapes that first people moved around the planet and established themselves in different places. So we have a lot of migration theories about people coming to the new world. And as I pointed out, the native people uh, are somewhat amused by it because they're just gonna say, it doesn't matter, we've been here all along. Um, and archaeology, indeed, can only point out the latest, oldest dated sites that have yet been found, not necessarily meaning uh, that they mark the beginnings of things. But we do find ancient peoples all the way in California and down to the tip of South America at a very early date. Um, <clears throat> and those dates keep getting pushed back further and further. Um, in this area, we find that San Francisco Bay was actually an oak covered woodland when first people are here already. And that the Farallon Islands are connected to the mainland. Um, and there is a different type of flora and fauna here to uh, greet the people and for the people to learn to manage. 
uh, Colombian mammoths that stood 13, 14 foot high at the shoulder, uh, browsers on the grasslands, much like cattle, you might imagine. Um, there were mastodons here. They were leaf-eating proboscideans. We had a giant type of bison called bison antiguus. There was a broad-faced bear. There were camels and horses. Camels and horses developed in the Americas and migrated into the old world, as did other populations of Native Americans. Now with DNA, we find that from the beginning of our registering of peoples, we can see that uh, it's complicated. People are going both directions into the new world and back again into Asia as well. So it's complicated from the beginning. So we know in the archeological record about these things that occur in the co-occurrence of people because we find specialized tools representing the technology of the day, oftentimes embedded in these animals or at butchering sites, such as these points that we for lack of a better term called Paleo-Indian points. Um, they're specialized tools that are around only so long as the native uh, animals they hunt are here. So after that, of course, the technology changes. Next slide, please, Mark. So we see these specialized tools develop to meet the technological need of the day. Um, hunting megafauna, very large animals is dangerous. It's um, a process that requires great skill. And, and the number of sites from those days are not well represented because there's so much environmental change uh, that is transpiring. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is a picture of Monterey Bay um, with the target site of a, ca of a mammoth I worked on near Castroville, along with other fossils that were found. That's not the usual purvey of archeologists. That's what paleontologists do but sometimes you have to take the opportunities and work with what you have. No one was available at the time, but the purpose of this slide is to show you where the former coastline was, that orangish tan color on your screen represent the for, represents the former coastline. So um, as a graphic, you can see that quite a bit of the landscape um, has been submerged at the end of the ice age. <clears throat> As um, ice uh, began to melt with, during a warming trend, this began around 11,000 years ago, sea level rose and it rose rapidly and it reached stabilization to about where you see it today, around 4,000 BC. Um, a lot of my students when I teach will say, ah, oh, it's a long time ago, 4,000 BC. And I remind them that we have literature from the day, the epic poem Gilgamesh from ancient Sumeria speaks about floods and environmental change. And indeed, many of our cherished stories of our origins speak of floods. And so too do Native American people speak about water and submergence. We see that large parts of the coastal landscape um, submerged and new vegetation communities formed. And throughout all of this environmental transformation, Native people were here um, making the adjustments for the new steps. <clears throat> And that, of course, is what makes the archaeological record particularly complex. About six to uh, about eight to four thousand BC, the bay begins to submerge as the wa rising waters enter the Golden Gate and submerge the what was formerly a valley. And after a time when sea level stabilizes, it takes a while for nature to develop an equilibrium around it. But once landscapes stabilize the archaeological record becomes visible from repetitive use of places. So you see our ability to look in the past is subject to environmental conditions um, that may inhibit, you know, the stories that we would like to know. Um, so again, this is what we can um, talk about from the archaeological perspective. So once the Bay Shore stabilizes, we see the development of a very, very productive uh, estuarine environment, uh, very rich in a marine life and um, so forth. Each one of these mires and estuaries that formed in the mud flats became home to countless numbers of crustaceans and uh, mammals adapted to those places, including sea mammals. Even today, harbor seals still haul out on the salt marsh levees. Um, but there once were large numbers of sea otters in the bay. Um, even Wales, uh, Father Font in 1774 writes about how San Francisco Bay stank from the exhalations of so many whales in the bay. These are scenes that are hard for us today 
to imagine and conceive the bounty of the bay was phenomenal. We also know it now as a major flyway for many uh, migratory birds. In the past, those migrations were of such large magnitude that the sunlight would be blocked out. And we hear historic accounts of uh, the magnificence of the wildlife of the Bay Area. And this was what supported native people for so long. Archeologists, of course, can only look at what preserves in the record. And for us, that's the stones, bones, and shells. What doesn't preserve are the stories, the laughter of children, uh, the leaders that came and went, you know, we don't know who the messiahs were that people might have seen, their prophets, their, uh, their leaders, their religious uh, events. These are things that are silent to us in the archeological record, but we know that all people, of course, uh, retain those characteristics. So why would this be any different? I show this slide as a talking point. Uh, we use certain artifact types as markers of time in the archeological record, such as these uh, dart tips. These um, existed long before the bow and arrow was an invention in the Bay Area. Um, they articulate with a device called an atlatl, uh, a spear thrower that looks something like uh, this. And basically it's a large dart that articulates to a, a piece of wood with a hook on the end that would propel the dart with great velocity. This is a, a technology that all of our ancestors knew. This was in existence in both the old world and the new world. Technology does change over time. Necessity changes things and so does the inventiveness of people so that we can see a transformation from uh, the technologies over time. At around 1000 BC, we start seeing greater territorial circumscription in the Bay Area where the Valley people and the Bay folks develop um, a distinctive economy somewhat different than the people of the coast of the peninsula. And I will speak more about those different economies in successive webinars that we have scheduled to come. This webinar is more about history and a context. The next ones will speak more about lifeways and stewarding the land and so forth. In any case, these are um, what I have published as Andy Nuevo long stems. Andy Nuevo was a major source for lithic materials and raw shell materials used in part of the economy. Um, but change does happen in time. I can see where people come from and travel around in the Bay Area by the residues they leave behind, in particular chip stone. These flakes you see in the screen are the waste flakes from making stone tools. They come from a site I worked on on Midpen property up along Skyline Boulevard, where a single three by three foot um, test excavation down six inches yield this many flakes. And what's significant about these flakes are the material types. They represent different lithic sources from around the bay. The banded material is coming from Anya Nuevo specifically. The multicolored Franciscan shirts or flints are coming from the other side of the San Andreas Fault throughout uh, Santa Clara Valley. Um, the Al chalcedony and opals, the white color you see there, are local to the skyline area. And then in the upper right, you see a big black flake of obsidian. Obsidian isn't local here at all. It has to be purchased from very distant communities, and I'll speak to that shortly. The main thing is to understand that technology does change. One of the great game changers around here was after a 200, 250 year drought, we call the medieval climatic anomaly took place. And we see a great deal of culture change ensue during that time and after, particularly after AD 1100, when um, the bow and arrow uh, becomes prevalent in the area. And we know because the projectile point types reduce in size significantly uh, compared to the dart tips of the past. So these tools are highly uh, important. I'll talk more about bow and arrow technology in a subsequent webinar, uh, but understand that culture change does occur. There is history in prehistory. Native Americans oppose a lot of the words we use in science for good reason. Word prehistory is one such case where it speaks as though there's no history in the past. And we use it to describe the, to distinguish the time of written records and before written records. So it's an arbitrary term in archeology. span I've come to prefer the word 
ancestral Native American versus prehistoric sites to talk about the ancestors of today's people um, and to reify the connectivity between then and now. All right, as I mentioned, obsidian was purchased from very distant tribes. It only occurs where there are volcanoes and there are no volcanoes here. So we find that obsidian can be sourced with a spectrograph. We can read the elemental structure of the artifact and determine its point of origin. And in the Bay Area, we find two primary source locations and the frequency of the material changes because of the economics and politics of various times. But the primary source locations include Napa Valley, Clear Lake area, um, and remember, there was no bridge across the bay then, so all of that had to be transported across the bay in boats, which is, again, another discussion item I'll bring up in subsequent talks, boats. Um, and the other source is east of the Sierra Nevadas, Bodie uh, Glass Mountain, uh, Mono Glass Mountain, Casa Diablo. That's the other side of Yosemite Valley. So you see there are very extensive trade networks uh, spread throughout the region. <clears throat> And in the Bay Area, um, the artistry manifest in the ability to make these tools is phenomenal. Uh, these are, this is an example of a projectile point from Fremont area, and we call them serrated points for good reasons. And they're a very, very distinctive uh, Central California style. <clears throat> People had an economy and we see it develop over thousands of years and the basis for uh, shell bead and uh, hence money um, is the olivella, olivella shell, the olivella biplicata snail shell, which was available to coastal people at certain locations where they would gather them and bleach them white to make them uh, uniform for bead manufacture and uh, production. We have found these beads in very old contexts. When I first started archaeology and excavated on Highway 101, before it was linked, um, we found a site five meters deep, that's almost 20 feet deep, where there was a hearth that included a rabbit bone and an olivella shell, and they both dated to uh, 7,400 BC. I've also looked at these beads um, associated with the native village at Mission Santa Clara and other missions, uh, which was occupied uh, right up until the American period. And we find these beads were still in vogue. So as far as I know, these are the oldest coinage in continuous use on the planet. Shell beads change in style through time and where they cut them from the uh, mother shell. And they become temporally diagnostic to archeologists. We can date the archeological site by the style of beads we see, like these rectangular beads that are centrally dr drilled um, they date to a specific time period. And so that's important because then we don't have to do destructive analysis like radiocarbon dating. Um, we also see changes in ornaments like these abalone pendants. Um, these pendants are actually not so much jewelry as badges that represent membership into select societies. And they too change over time. <clears throat> a lot of people talk to me about they think that native culture was simple somehow here and living in some kind of idyllic setting. And they, they neglect the fact that actually cultures were quite complex here and sophisticated. And part of that is because people don't see pyramids or standing stone monuments. And yet there were monuments here once upon a time. There were um, quite a number in 1909, the University of California plotted some 425 monumental mounds some quite large, including the Castro Mound in Mountain View, which was big as a football field. Um, and by the way, was an earth mound, not composed of shell. So we know that they are architecturally designed constructs. This is a profile of a shell midden on the coast where you see the shell, the charcoal, and the dietary uh, constituents of the site. And this is what archeologists look at when we try and reconstruct diets of the past. <clears throat> The shell mounds are mostly gone. There were no laws to protect them. And even though archeologists scrambled in the day to try and recover information from them and never once thought about notifying the native people, they didn't even know they were still here. Um, but we watch as these shell mounds were bulldozed away and transformed into the roadbeds of our highway system today. This is a picture of the Emeryville shell mound being removed by a steam shovel in 1924. So with these images gone, we lose track of the actual 
complexity. This is a map produced by my late friend, Dr. Randy Milliken, who went through the mission records and reconstructed the organization and names of the tribal polities of the Bay Area. And from this map, you get a better idea of how the word Ohlone is a little simple for what really was here. We use the word Ohlone much like you might use the word European or African or Asian, knowing that within that term, there are many cultures and many people. So it's important to understand that. Today, many of the uh, descendants of the mission people from the San Francisco Bay Area and Monterey Bay Area have decided to re-identify and reorganize into their own terms and names. And that's their story. And so I hope that you will take the time, as Mark suggested, to look at the links to their websites and hear their story. Um, and uh, hopefully they will someday take this narrative and tell it uh, rather than me. This is another map Randy created of the tribal polities of the area, and it serves to emphasize how cosmopolitan the place was. And um, so it's complex. Next slide. Um, the local housing was built generally in the fall, a framework of willow poles uh, thatched by Thule uh, rushes and thatched tightly for the winter time. This is where the housing, uh, the people would stay in their housing. Um, come uh, springtime, these were often uh, burned for hygiene. The people were very conscious of hygiene and maintaining their health. House sizes, of course, could vary according to the number of people that occupied them. And so some villages are larger than others. Um, they're not all equally the same. And so looking at this lifestyle, we gaze into the cultures of the Bay Area and augment what the archeology span tells us through the living memories of the people today. And I'm very happy to say that most of my life has been spent listening and trying to learn from the people um, and what they have to tell me, uh, which is what brings me here. So this is an image um, done by my friend, Ann Tierman of Kiroste Valley, where we have worked to create a 220 acre cultural preserve to celebrate native traditional land use, which I'll speak about in subsequent webinars. But here you get an idea of uh, ceremonial uh, events. And of course, all of this com it comes to a crashing halt in October of 1769 with the advent of the first European exploration of the coast under the command of Don Gaspar de Portola, who was a gentleman who had bought his commission. They continue their journeys under the king's orders to find Monterey Harbor um, and they leave and go north with the diarist Father Juan Crespi and Miguel Costanzo, an engineer, and their diaries become priceless insights into both the landscape and encounters with the native people, although they must be read through the lens of the colonial times that they were written in. Um, and so we find that with the advent of Spanish colonization after 1770, with the establishment uh, in, up in the Bay Area of Mission San Carlos and the Royal Presidio of Monterey, uh, things begin to change rapidly as native people are now exposed to new conditions and life ways. <clears throat> Next slide. Over a period of 50 some years, the Spaniards would colonize coastal California through a number of presidial districts, which are uh, governed by the military and establishing um, some 21 uh, California missions as a way of reducing native population and bringing them in to make them, as they said, men of reason, um, to convert them to become citizens of Spain. There was not enough uh, incentive for people from Mexico to colonize California. And so the goal was to convert the native people into the citizenry in, in a feudal system that the Spaniards knew which included an aristocracy, a merchant class, and the farmers and fishermen, the peons. So they were trying to reconstruct that social hierarchy here. And of course, we know where the California Indians fit in this um, so, uh, through the establishment of these three uh, institutions, the Pueblo, the Mission, and the Presidio. In this diagram, you see their role, and it is exclusively as laborers. And so thus we begin to see the strong decline of native California culture in the onslaught of the dominant cultures. And from the start, the two cultures are 
ideologically in different universes. They see the world different, they interpret things differently. And so the opportunity for miscommunication is strong. Um, for native people, they could not interpret a lot of the symbols in the missions. They were alien, just as alien as is many of the shamanic rock art features um, that we can't read e anymore. Um, for native people, it was very dire. Once brought into the mission, their lives changed. They could not leave. And so we see a transformation of people and their exposure to uh, new diseases and diet and violence. And it just disrupted the people uh, in a very, very traumatic way. So that we see approximately of the thousands of Indians brought into the missions, only about 5% actually survive. It's a very high mortality rate, which of course the priests were aware of. So we see that there is history in the missions. There are 50 years of occupation include layers from voluntary conversions when people were invited to come in and then not allowed to leave to later when the missions established military forces in the missions made of Native Americans to go out and get other Native Americans. By about 1805 at Mission Santa Clara, we no longer see Ohlone villages uh, coming in and being brought in for baptism and conversion. We now see the game is being taken to the Central Valley, to the Yokuts, to Sierra Miwok, the Bay Miwok peoples. The Spaniards call them all Tularenos, the Tuli people, and conflict ensues. You know, over a period of time, we see the native people at the missions also establish a community there. At Mission Santa Clara, there were five rows of adobe apartments to house 1,400 married couples. And so we see also that many of the natives in the mission were armed. We, uh, these arrowheads you are seeing now were recently recovered from the neophyte quarters at Mission Santa Clara, where 100 specimens were found, uh, many made of bottle glass and porcelain. And we now realize that while the oppression was huge, um, some of the native people at the mission were also part of the auxiliary forces under the directions of the soldiers to get more native people. It's similar to the slave trade that occurred uh, with African Americans where you have those on the inside and those on the outside. It's a complex history of many stories. So um, next slide, please. Um, the native people of the missions um, were described by others, of course, who see them in a state of despair. So the descriptions are very biased of what native people look like. Um, that sketch is of the native people by Mission San Jose, and they are um, actually near where the BART station is now. Uh, next slide. And so during the period of time, uh, we see the revolution in Mexico take place and uh, succeed so that by 1822, we have the new Republic of Mexico and a change of order uh, amongst the native people and the missionaries. Now we see uh, the Mexican Republic uh, disband the missions and their property and open them up to private ownership so that by 1832, with the law of secularization to break up the land holdings that the missionaries held ostensibly in trust for their native people, um, now is now open to private ownership. And some 8 million acres are spread out that way. <clears throat> with the introduction of livestock, which roams freely around here, the money was in the leather uh, and in the fat in the bones. So we see the hide and tallow industry emerge. Native people were participant. They are the caballeros and the vaqueros. They're the cowboys doing the work. They didn't disappear. Um, but the landscape changes forever with the advent of ranching and the cessation of native land management practices, which I will uh, elaborate on in a subsequent uh, discussion. So native people don't disappear with the missions. They continue, they persevere. Their population recovers and they become part of the working force, the labor force of Mexican California. Um, and um, with that, we also see that Mexico now opens its ports to foreign traders like the Americans and Brits 
who also start seeking opportunities in the interior of California. Um, it's like the Swiss immigrant, John Sutter, who found Sutter's Fort at what is now uh, Sacramento and is also a state park. So new ideas begin to come in. By 1845, the annexation of Texas, we see the advent of the Mexican-American War, where the United States expands its boundaries significantly. And of interest to me is Article 11, which um, requires that uh, Native people not be removed or resettled from their lands uh, by citizens of the US. That sounds pretty good, but the ink isn't even dry when John Marshall discovers gold in the Sierra foothills and it triggers one of the greatest migrations of humans in history, where at the time there were some less than 6,000 Mexican citizens on the census in California. The first year we have 10,000 miners show up, then 100,000, then 200,000. There is no law and order, there is no government until 1850 when California is annexed to the United States and we see the first legislature convene at Colton Hall in Monterey, also a state park. And um, unfortunately, some of the first laws legislated were acts of genocide, which I will highlight momentarily. Uh, first, this graph, which displays the consequence of contact for native Californians with the outside cultures. The dark color represents the coastal colonization by Imperial Spain. And then you see some cross-hatched area, the Mexican Republic basically fell into the same land holdings, expanding slightly in Northern California to Redding. Um, but then with the gold rush, all the four corners of the state were uh, visited by miners, not always the best characters to meet indigenous people. And we start seeing the beginning of the Holocaust. Um, the miners that come in soon seize the lands of the uh, existing Mexican ranchers um, as they take over their orchards for the fruit and work to uh, take over the livestock and basically just swarm the landscape like locusts. And so we see that for the Mission Indians, in some ways they're more fortunate because they've become lumped into Hispanic society um, and become invisible to the new hordes coming in and are somewhat spared from the genocide that will now commence in the Sierras and elsewhere. So these are the people that survive and become the people of the communities we consult with today. This is a map that I don't have a lot of time to elaborate on, but I wanted to show you that we do reconstruct some of these post-mission histories. This is by Alan Brown, and it shows um, the Mountain View, Sunnyvale, and Palo Alto area, area with the trail dotted line that was the middle of the field trail. You may be familiar with that term still as middle field, the El Camino Real and Brown. There was a village called Sohorpi at what is now El Camino Real and 85 in Mountain View where post-mission Indian people were raising vegetables for the society around them. Moffat Field was once called, called Posalmi. It was one of only three land grants given to Mission Santa Clara Indians. Posalmi had a leader named Lope Inigo who uh, moved his community back to there and it became designated as a, a reservation up until 1865 when the family sells the land and moves out. Um, and so there are other places, Ulysses Tack, which is um, near North First Street and Gorgonio's property at Rancho La Parisima, which is now near Foothill College in Los Altos Hills. Those were the land grants that native people got. And what we see is that native people are still here. So the beginning of the California legislature began um, enacting laws that are uh, both heinous and tragic. One of the first laws was the Indentured Servitude Act, which allowed the slavery of Indian children in particular because there was bounty on the parents. Parents could be shot and murdered uh, randomly without any cause whatsoever, and the children could be gathered up and sold into slavery. And that became a very lucrative market so that we see quite a number of uh, people um, piling into that industry. And it is one of the great traumas, I think, of our nation um, that is very little known. The legislation also prohibited Native Americans from testifying in court against the people perpetrating their crimes against uh, the families. It's a very dark time, 
many Native Americans, particularly in the Bay Area, uh, identified as Mexican to be safe from the onslaught that was going on around them. It's a very difficult history to teach, and it's worse because the state and government and local communities also worked um, to eradicate people. Battalions of vigilantes were formed up to eliminate Native people um, who they accused of predating on their livestock. Well, when you shoot up all the game, the people have to eat and they'll shoot a cow, um, but then pay the penalty by being massacred. So that we see uh, the state legislature reimburse vigilante groups in 1852 alone, $1.1 million. Uh, uh, you know, what's that worth at the time? You know, for the cost of their bullets and expeditions. And it continues for a time, as you can read uh, in this slide, a very difficult time. We see that people survived. The indigenous people are resilient. They are, are persistent and they are here still to tell us about their survival and also to help us become aware of the real history that took place here. You can't have a healing if people don't understand the trauma that took place. In this picture, you see a woman with her hair cropped short. That's a sign of mourning where someone in her family has been lost. So these images become very poignant. Next slide, please. Coupling trauma for Native people is the period when the University of California first established the Department of Anthropology. Anthropology was a new field of science um, that sought to study human culture and history. It stemmed from um, the realms of psychology and linguistics. And so the students of anthropology uh, oftentimes were tutored by this man on the, on the screen, Alfred Krober, and you see him with Ishii, who was one of the uh, few survivors of the Yahi people. They had been hammered by vigilantes five times so that uh, very few were left. And then one, who he, Ishii comes out of the mountains in 1911 for the first time near Lassen. And I remind people, my father was born just 19 years after that. So it puts things in a very um, interesting timeline as we try and understand uh, our relationships to native people. So anthropologists and archeologists swarmed the back countries to try and get the last remembrances of the people. Unfortunately, while they recognized the cultures were stressed and traumatized and disappearing in many ways, um, they never thought about saving the people. It was all about saving the information. So these are the things that we carry um, with us as we try and understand these histories I didn't speak to you about the Indian Termination Act where in the 1950s, their health benefits were arbitrarily cut and they were left bereft or about the Indian boarding schools where young children were forcibly taken from their parents throughout the United States and sent to remote areas where they were receiving religious indoctrination through boarding schools and having their culture um, eliminated from their society. So these are very difficult topics that I've touched upon very briefly, and certainly there's a great deal more to be said. I think this provides a context for us to understand that Native people uh, deserve our respect and our empathy, and in state parks, that is my role, to try and uh, bring Native cultures back to their homelands and invite them back into our parks. Thank you, Mark. That is a very difficult history to absorb. And I hope that everybody who is listening um, is feeling impacted by it and thinking about what are the next steps to learning um, and to engaging with these issues. Um, and supporting justice. And of course, like we said earlier, um, you know, Mark, you are uniquely, um, you, you have a unique history and we very much appreciate you taking the time to share your knowledge that you've, you've gained through your work in support of justice and um, of the tribes of the area. Of, of course, this is not a substitute 
again for learning for the native people who um, from the native people who are here today. Um, I do want to give a shout out to Canyon, who is in chat, who's been helping to clarify a lot of conversation that's occurring um, in our chat. Um, and remind everybody to look on our Facebook event, um, as well as the email that we sent out for a whole list of resources to learn more about, um, you know, current day issues, um, organizations and tribes to support. <clears throat> so thank you for that, Mark. Um, I hope the message is well received. Yeah. Um, and so uh, we, we're, we're at one o'clock now, but we are going to um, reserve some time for some questions um, from the audience. And um, my colleague Katie has been um, looking at the questions and trying to identify some of the themes um, that are coming up for people. Um, and I want to um, start with this first question, Mark, um, and you addressed it already. Um, but there's a, there's a question about, you know, accountability right. for Mark's agencies, for the organizations that are part of this um, event and, and, and others out there about how we are addressing, you know, um, justice and, and, um, and reaching out, outreach, um, supporting current efforts by by tribes in the area. Is there any examples um, uh, or other thoughts you want to share about that? Um, you shared some great examples already. Yeah, in fact, actually, some of those um, statements or questions were better addressed in some of the subsequent webinars. One of the one I want to talk about is one of the things my agency has been doing to encourage uh, partnership with local tribal government. And we do see it as a government to government uh, relationship. And so in my capacity, I've been working with several groups to uh, provide access to parks, but we actually worked together with the Alan Lutzen not too long ago to establish a 220 acre Carusti Valley Cultural Preserve at Andy Nuevo State Park. It's um, the first time state parks has established a cultural preserve based on the principles of traditional land management. So we're working to stabilize that place, to restore a habitat uh, as it uh, appears to have been. And we're doing it completely with cooperation with the tribe. We're actually providing jobs for some of the tribal members to have the ability to learn how to use tools like chainsaws. Um, we're in the modern age, you can't be hacking at trees with stone axes with any uh, success. And so we're trying to restore in that area, particularly native grassland, uh, which is very hard to preserve. Um, similarly, we're trying to reinterpret, you know, relationships. Per, uh, we also have Mission Santa Cruz State Historic Park, and it has always been an epicenter of concern for native people. And our interpreters have been working very hard with local native people to reinterpret it. I think we're one of the few that I've heard from native people that um, we've had a more progressive approach to it than others. Uh, we just had some vandalism occur there the uh, day before yesterday, and we recognize it as a symbol for people. And so we're working with our historian, Martin Rizzo, who's writing a book actually about the native people of Mission Santa Cruz um, and works with the native people as well. Uh, we're looking at how to increase the dialogue at that place. So use the park as a public forum to discuss difficult issues like social rights and such, rather than turn it into an object or symbol of oppression, which it can be, right? We ought to use the facility then to open the dialogue up. And I think we're, we're looking at it that way, particularly in the context of what's going on right now. Uh, our uh, ranger force and parks personnel, our maintenance people and interpreters have all um, come on board with this outlook. Um, I know we have uh, a limited time, so I, I don't want to belabor my talk, except to add that the issues of late native land management, which I'll speak to, particularly burning to increase productivity of the land through controlled prescription fires, um, that's permeated our state parks natural resource culture. 
it is now being uh, professed throughout the state that this partnership we've created in our district is gaining legs. It's picking up all over. MidPen recently celebrated the opening of Mount Um by creating a, a ceremonial center, a dance place for people. Um, these are attitudes that have changed. Uh, Semp Virens is working with us to create a native garden with Moekma, the Moekma people, um, and so forth. Um, I think that it's hard for native people who have been suffering for so long to actually see something positive that's coming out of all this. And so it's our job to nurture that. Thank you for sharing that, Mark. And I think what you shared about the changing attitudes as we have an increased awareness, you know, individuals that add up to organizations and communities, um, that's how change needs to occur, you know, and it starts with talks like these. Um, uh, at post, uh, speaking to another example regarding fire, um, we're very honored to have supported um, the Amamutsun Land Trust and Tribal Band in bringing fire back to an area above Davenport, um, San Vicente Redwoods right. um, recently. And so um, I think uh, all these organizations are, are, are working to identify the steps to um, achieving, you know, greater justice in these areas. Um, maybe I, I need to inter interject, you know, we often use terms of color, white, red, black, yellow. I learned a lot from Lakota people. I was part of a Lakota family uh, for quite a while and learned to speak a little Oglala Sioux. There are quite a few of them from the urban relocation programs of the government living here in the Bay Area. And one of the elders told me a long time ago, and it resonates still, red, black, yellow, and white are not skin colors, they're attitudes, they're outlooks and uh, beliefs in how we look at the world. So I'd like to hold that because all four colors are within a circle, a hoop, and that binds us all, regardless of our color, we're all on this planet together. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, and so I think that's a nice uh, place to end on. Um, I, a lot, there's a lot of questions about specifics, you know, um, uh, and I think you're going to be speaking to the, a lot of that in, yeah. in subsequent webinars. Um, so I'm going to end it there. I think this was a good starting point. Um, of course, we welcome any feedback from community members. We appreciate you. Um, um, being patient with us as we try to use our platform to elevate these conversations. Um, and um, our, our goal is to, you know, um, positively impact these issues. So um, thank you for your feedback in advance. Please do not forget to read about those resources that we shared. Um, and with that, Mark, um, thank you again. Can you share a little bit, um, a couple of words about what we're going to be speaking about next week? Yes, next week is um, two discussions. We have, well, next week we'll be talking about uh, more of the material culture, um, management of the land, um, some of the things that I've been able to uh, participate in with our land management process. So we're, we'll be talking more about stewarding the land and uh, the exposure I've had to that. You know, thank you to my Native American brothers and sisters who actually uh, learn, taught me about that and are learning from our mutual relationship. So we'll be learning about land management next week. I wanna talk a little bit about the maritime on the bay and uh, the Thule boats. And uh, I wanna discuss how the mounted sites may have been ports actually um, so I'll dig a little deeper into that. Great. Thank you, Mark. All right. Well, I'll see you next week then. Thank you. And we'll invite everyone back to the living room. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.